Romans chapter 1, verse 1, written by the Apostle Paul, the Apostle, the Epistle, which means letter of Paul, written by Paul, to the Romans. So he wrote this to the church in Rome. All right. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. Now, I know that sometimes I kind of start a little too quick and don't really get through reading, but I wanted to bring out a couple of points. Number one, I wanted you to understand that that word servant right there in the Greek language, because I'm going to come back to it again, but I want to at least introduce you to the thought process now. The word in the Greek is this right here. If you were going to spell it in English, it's doulos, okay? It's translated as servant in the King James Version, but in the New King James Version, it's translated as this. It's translated as a slave. Now, that had a lot of meaning. That had a lot of meaning to the Roman people because slavery was active, was active in Rome whenever Paul was writing this letter. Now, what Paul does is that he calls himself a slave. He's calling himself a slave uh, of Jesus Christ. And so I just wanted to point that out to you and that he's been separated unto the gospel of God. OK, he says, which he had promised afore by his prophets and the Holy Scriptures. In other words, he promised the gospel through the prophets in the Old Testament concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh. And declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Now, <clears throat> I don't want to spend too much time there, but I do want to point out we've talked about these types of things multiple times in the church. But sometimes there's people that don't that haven't been around as much and maybe don't understand some things. God has a rich heritage throughout the entirety of the scripture where he's communicating his plan to mankind. Paul makes allusion to it right here when he says that this has been a mentioned aforehand in the past by the prophets. And he explains that he was he was the, the he was the seed of, of David, according to the flesh. What does that mean? That means that in the Old Testament, God had promised that he was going to bring a deliverer. He was going to bring a Messiah, which means an anointed one, one who was going to bring rescue to the people. And he was going to come through David. Now, we who have been studying the Bible understand that David was the greatest king that Israel ever had. Promises hundreds of years before Jesus ever showed up on the earth said that he, Jesus didn't say his name, but said that there was a rescuer coming and he was going to come from David's family, David's lineage. In addition to that, the scripture says right here that he was not only declared to be the seed of David in his physical birth, but he was declared to be the son of God through the resurrection. Well, what does that mean? That means that Jesus died, but he resurrected from the dead. That's part of the power of the gospel. What it tells us, see, and we're going to get into it a little bit this morning, but let's go ahead and preface it now, that the wages of sin is death. We don't have to like that. We don't have to even like the word sin if we don't want to. The Bible is filled with that word. The Bible explains that that is the problem between humanity and God, but that God has an answer and that it was the giving of his son. Amen. The wages of sin is death. That means when you go to work, you earn a paycheck. When you were born of Adam, you earned a paycheck. The paycheck was death because you had already been born a sinner. Plus, each and every one of us have given our own sin into the pot, if you will. And so the, what we deserve from God because of our sin that we received from Adam was death, but that God offered a way out. Amen. What Jesus did was he had no sin and because he had no sin and he died, he paid the penalty for sin, not for his own sin because he had none. He wasn't guilty. He paid the penalty of sin for you. He paid the penalty of sin for me. And because of that, death had no right to hold him down. The resurrection proves a lot of things. It proves Jesus had no sin. It proves that Jesus paid for every sin. Because had Jesus had sin, he wouldn't have resurrected. Had Jesus not paid for every sin, he wouldn't have resurrected. Now, how do you know he resurrected, preacher? Well, number one, they never found his bones. Amen. But number two, he lives in my heart. I know that he's resurrected. I know that he's alive. Because I've seen the transformation in the life that he's given me. Amen. And I hope that you've experienced that too. It says in verse 5, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Now, I think it's important, too, that we also discuss nations. When me and 
Brother Larry were having a talk this morning. And nations can be interchanged with the word Gentile. Gentiles were those people, other nations, that were not Jewish people. The Jewish people were very special because they were the nation that God created for himself. Amen? It's not that other nations in the world aren't important. These were the people called and created by God to carry God's word, his heritage, who he was, to a lost and a dying world. Paul said, we've received grace and apostleship to bring this gospel message, the good news about Jesus Christ, to these nations so that those that are in darkness and blinded to the truth can hear the truth, can receive the light, and can embrace the plan of God, amen, amen. and receive the life of God. Yes. And so that's what he's talking about right there. He's talking about the gospel. And he says, among whom are you also called of Jesus Christ? To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request, if by any means, now at length, I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. For I long to see you that I might impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end you may be established. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. You know, that's what we have in common. You know, you hear me talk about that. I mentioned it at their, at their wedding about communion. I use that terminology a lot about the fact that it's a compound word common union and the common union that we have is the body of Christ is that is that we have a common faith we have a common faith that the gospel is true Amen. and the gospel says that man is born the sinner but that God has a beautiful plan of salvation Hallelujah. and that through faith in that our sin is forgiven and we've become one together in Christ. Amen. Amen. There's a mutual faith. And Paul's excited about that. Yeah. The church of Rome has a mutual faith. The, the, the church here has a mutual faith. People that are truly the children of God have a mutual faith. Well, what you trying to say? That everybody that calls himself Christian ain't Christian? That's exactly what I'm trying to say. Right. Amen. I'm not trying to say that Christians are perfect. Lord knows if you thought that that was you, you just need to look at yourself in the mirror a little bit closer. Because believe me. I look at myself in the mirror and I realize that. That's not what, that's not what makes true Christianity. True Christianity it bows its knee to the truth of the gospel that Jesus Christ is indeed the plan of God. Amen. And that Amen. salvation through faith in what he did Amen. changes the heart. Amen. All right. He says, uh, now I would not have you ignorant. This is verse 13. Now, I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was let hitherto. In other words, I was restrained. I wasn't able to make it. He wanted to go, but he couldn't make it. That I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. So there we go. Instead of nations right there, it's used Gentiles. And Paul had been to multiple nations and had preached the gospel in multiple occasions. You know, I just want to real quick say, you know, you, sometimes we think, I don't know about you, but I grew up all my life. My daddy was trying to talk about oh, how important it was to be tough and and all this kind of stuff. And I even wrote something in my notes this morning. I don't know if I'll get to it. But how, you know, so all my life I grew up and my dad was trying to emphasize how important it was because he, he was a tough guy. And so you grow up with a certain mindset. And I ain't never met nobody tougher than the Apostle Paul. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you that right now. I don't know what he looked like. I mean, you could Maybe he couldn't even been a football player. But, but, but let, me, let me tell you something. This man took a beating on his back five times with a whip, took a beating in his head three different times with rods, took, was stoned and left for dead in the street, was shipwrecked three different times and left in the water, was found naked because the robbers had found him in the mountains and beat him up and stripped him of his clothes, was found in the rain, was found in the cold. And guess what? Each and every time, you know what he did? He got up. 
He was imprisoned on multiple times, not for selling drugs on the side of the street, not for doing the kind of stuff I used to do, but for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And each and every time he came against the persecution, each and every time he came against the violence of the enemy, you know what he did? He stood up by the grace of God and he moved forward for the kingdom of God and he continued to do the work of God. Amen. I don't think my daddy even had a clue what that kind of toughness was all about. And, and what I'm trying to say is, is that sometimes we think the gospel's weak. Sometimes we look at certain things, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit here in a little bit. But I'm here to tell you, ain't nothing weak about the gospel. Ain't nothing weak about Jesus. There ain't nothing weak about the power of God. It's the power of God unto salvation. It will deliver your soul from the grip of hell. It will deliver your soul from the grip of evil. Amen. The gospel will change you. Praise God. He says right here in verse 14, he says, I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. I didn't plan on getting into all this like this, but I just can't. When I see these words, I remember Luke Pope preached on this and he said, I am debtor. Yeah, I remember he emphasized that. He kept saying, this is my name. I'm debtor. What does it mean? I owe you a debt. Why do you owe Rome a debt, Paul? Because something happened to him. You can't explain that to people that haven't truly experienced. Listen, there's people in this room right here that you still, by the listen, do I always do it the way it's supposed to be done? Absolutely not. But I'm telling you right now, I have experienced what Paul's talking about at least on a few occasions in my life. I'm debtor. What are you talking about? I'm talking about, I, I don't even know you, but I owe you. What are you talking about? I want to owe no man. When the Holy Ghost, through faith in Jesus Christ, reaches in and grabs a hold of your heart, and you become a slave of Jesus Christ like Paul was, your name is changed to debtor. You begin to realize that you owe a debt because Jesus paid a debt for you that he didn't owe, and you owe him something because he gave his life for you. And Paul said, I am debtor. I'm debtor to you, and I want to I want to come to you, and I, I want to let others know about the goodness of God. Sometimes we just don't feel like it, man. Life is busy. We get caught up in our own little thing. Lord knows I've been there. Probably be there tomorrow. <laughs> get all caught up in our own little world, things going on in our mind, trying to drag us down. I'm here to tell you right now, when the gospel changes you, you become debtor and you begin to realize there's something bigger to this life than just me and what I want out of it. And I'm supposed to be doing some things for the Lord. Amen. Mm -hmm. And it's supposed to give back to the kingdom of God. Amen. I'm not talking about working your way into heaven. You can't work your way into heaven. You can't, you can't really pay him back. <laughs> I remember one time I was praying in the morning. I was like, Lord, I'm telling you, man, look. After God showed up and spoke to me in that ballroom bathroom, after my sister died, and, 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 and God really just revolutionized my world. I was so, I was deader. I was so excited to feel the freedom and the liberty. For the first time in my life, I realized how real the gospel was. And I can remember just thanking the Lord and saying, Lord, how in the world does a man repay you for this kind of love? I can remember I was all King James. What manner of love is this that you've bestowed upon me? How will a man repay you for this love? And I can remember the Lord speaking to my spirit. He said, a man cannot repay me. You can't repay me for what I've done. But I laid my life down for you. And now I'm asking you to lay your life down for me. Can I be honest with you and tell you that sometimes I don't feel like laying my life down? I'm just going to be real transparent because, look, I want you to love me. But if that's what's going to keep you coming back to this church, you'll probably leave next week. <laughs> what I do want you to know is this, is that there's sometimes that, guess what, in our own selfishness, we just don't want to go on. Sometimes, you know, I just be honest with you. Sometimes look at the exit door and say, look, okay, I'm about to make my exit. But I'm debtor. You can't just do whatever you want to do. John Robert used to say it all the time. You're not your own. That's right. You've been bought with a price. Amen. Jesus purchased you through the shedding of his blood. You don't belong to yourself anymore. You belong to the Lord. Amen. Amen? Amen. And so therefore, things have changed. So he says right here in verse 15, he says, So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. And this is really, these next two verses are the passages that I really want to focus on. But he says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God 
unto salvation to everyone that believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein, in the gospel, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. And as, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Now, just real quick, I want to explain to you, the, up until this point, what we read, Paul introduced himself. He introduced himself as a slave, as an apostle, as a preacher of the gospel, an ambassador. That's what an apostle, apostle means, an ambassador. He's a messenger to bring forth the message. He says he wants to bring it to the nations. He wants to bring it. He's brought it to other Gentiles. He wants to bring it to Rome, too. He wants to impart a gift. They have a mutual faith. He's introduced himself to the church of Rome. Then he, he emphasizes the importance of the gospel. And then now he, there's a little bit of a change that's taken place. He's talked about the importance of the gospel. He's talked about his purpose. Now he's beginning to talk about when it says men who suppress the truth, hold it down, reject it, ignore it, don't embrace it. Some things start happening. When mankind rejects the truth of the gospel, some things start to happen. What happens? A spiraling downward. Come on, somebody, because it ain't just for the world to hear it. Oh, we're about to get into it. I hope you don't hate me when it's all said and done, but we're about to get into it. The world is spiraling out of control morally. Amen. Amen. You turn on the television and you watch it and in all of these shows, commercials left and right, all of these ads all over the Internet, whatever the case, homosexuality is given the same equality as a man and a woman being married. I'm here to tell you that it's not because I'm a bigot. It's not because I don't love people. It's not because I don't even love homosexuals. Because I do. I can tell you there was a time when I probably would have said, well, I don't know that I do. I can remember one time sitting in class as a freshman in English, and I had a very homosexual teacher. I mean very homosexual. You know, long fingernails and, you know, walking around like that the whole time. And I can remember I had a question, and he came over there, and he put his hand on my shoulder and I remember looking at him and it like this. Don't, don't touch me, dude. I don't feel that way anymore. I walk up and give that dude a hug. If I can tell him the truth about Jesus Christ. If I can tell him the truth that Jesus loves him. And listen, God don't look at him any different than he looks at Matt and Matt's sin. Amen. Jesus is the answer for it all. But what I'm here to tell you, what you're going to see at the end of the chapter one of the book of Romans is that when men suppress the truth, whether it's the world or people in the church, some things start to happen. There's a spiraling downward of their morality. There's a moving further away from the light of God into darkness. And it results in depravity. It results in a falling away. It results in being separated from the presence of God. And so that's what he says. He says, the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel. But verse 18, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. It means to suppress the truth. They continue on in their unrighteous ways. The wrath of God being revealed from heaven isn't talking about the kind of wrath of God in the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, it's called Thumos Wrath. It's a breathing slaughter of humanity. Fire and brimstone starts to fall from the sky. Earth begins to quake. Sun becomes black. Moon turns to blood. And people are dying and running, uh, hiding under rocks for fear that they're going to die. This is different. This is slow, insidious. You don't even Amen. hardly know what's happening. Amen. You're rejecting the truth. Your heart becomes a little harder. You reject more truth. Comes a little bit blacker. You don't even realize it, but one day you wake up and you don't even want to, you don't believe God's real. That's right. Or you don't even want to serve God anymore. That's right. It's a yeah. slow, spiraling down, moving away further and further from the things of God. This is the truth of the gospel. It says, verse 19, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. God has revealed his truth to people. People just don't want to believe God's real. The scientist thinks he's so smart. He thinks he's so wise. He's come up with all this stuff. Let me tell you something. I don't even, I don't even know how I, what's going on today, but let me just say this. Lord, you take over this message. 
You know, whenever, whenever I wrote that crazy book about the Illuminati and I started researching all of that kind of stuff, my eyes were open up to all kinds. Let me tell you something. You think for one second that prominent scientists who believe in the theory of evolution, if they found pieces and parcels that disproved their theory and proved the truth of God, wouldn't lie and hide it and cover it up in order to prevent people from being able to see the truth? No, I'm here to tell you that the enemy or the God of this world has blinded the eyes of those who would be able to see the truth and the reality is is that no science doesn't have the answer that the gospel has to line up with at least not in my book I'm holding on to the Bible no, no the, the, the Bible has the truth and the proof and science should be looking for the answers connected to that. As a matter of fact, there's been quotes from prominent evolutionists, prominent scientists that say the theory of evolution has to be the truth because the alternative is unthinkable. Well, you better believe it's unthinkable. Yeah. <laughs> you better believe it's unthinkable because that means that there's a God. And a God that you're going to answer to. Yeah. And a God that your blackened and darkened heart has told you the truth and you reject it. And because you rejected it, you found yourself falling further and further away. And there's a judgment that's going to come. Yeah. And it's not that God wants to judge. He has to judge. Yeah. He has to judge unrighteousness and sin. And that's why he judged it on his son. But if you reject the son and the judgment that was placed on him, then now you're, going, you're asking to be judged for yourself. He says uh, that, that because when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. I'm sorry, verse 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they were without the excuse. Basically what Paul's saying right here is, through creation and conscience, he's revealed himself to man. Before you even get saved. Before you even get saved, at some point in time in your life, you knew God was real. He revealed himself to you. He revealed himself. He he, he put a copyright in your heart and says, hey, I'm real. I don't know how he did it to you, but in some way, shape, or form, he's revealed to you at some point in time in your life that he was real. There's been a time when you were driving down the road and you saw them clouds rolling across and that Tyndall's effect where the sunlight shines through and causes those rays to hit. And, and you see the, and the, the beauty of the blue that's around the clouds. And for some reason, out of nowhere, you said there is a God. Just because of that, just because of the beauty of creation, you said that in your heart, there is a God and there's got to be more than this. There's got to be more than this. Just driving down this road and all these cars passing me by. I'm here to tell you that there is. Amen. Amen. He's created through, through creation and conscience. He has revealed himself to mankind and revealed the truth. He says, uh, verse um, 20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they're without excuse. God's saying, you're without excuse. You chose to go another way. I revealed myself to you. I gave you conscience. I gave you creation. And I sent you my son. You're without excuse. You want to blame it all on me, huh? You want to blame it on me. You want to call me the bad guy that's sending people to hell? No, I didn't send nobody to hell. I sent a lamb. Amen. I sent a lamb to die for your sin and you rejected it. That's the gospel. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. They knew he was God. He revealed himself as God. But what they did was they rejected him as God and darkened their own heart. One of the things that I was going to say, I was going to say, point number one, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Point number two, I'm not mad at the gospel. Sometimes, you know, we can start to get mad at the gospel. I don't like what it's telling me. I don't like the way this is going. I don't like the way my life is right now. I don't want this life. I want to do my own stuff. You can start getting mad at God. And God's over there like, hold on a second. I'm God. I'm the potter. You're the clay. Are you going to talk back to me? You're going to tell me you don't like, well, this is my word. You don't have to like him if you don't want to. That's how God, don't get me wrong, he's a lot more merciful than me. He's a lot more loving than me. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> right? <laughs> Thank you, Lord. He's got more, much more patience than I do. Thank you, Lord. Amen? But at the same time, the black and white of it is, it's no gray. He's God. He's the potter. We're the clay. His word has revealed it. Question is, are we going to read it, learn it, and get in line with it? Amen? Amen. All right. He says right here, verse 22, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. 
Well, I wish I was smart enough to have a conversation with a scientist and just leave him all confused and discombobulated and say, that's right there, bro. Romans 1, 22. You thought your wisdom was going to bring you up. Because of your wisdom, you made yourself a fool. Verse 23. And change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and the birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. In other words, instead of worshiping God, they made statues and they worshiped that instead. They worshiped themselves first, the wisdom of their knowledge, because Satan came to Eve in the garden and said, In the day that you eat thereof, you shall not die, but instead you shall become as gods. That's why all them people in the music industry, that, that's what they, that, and all that Illuminati junk, that they're trying to reach the status of a god. A vessel that demon spirits would inhabit and use. That's another story for me. Verse 24, wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up into vile affections. It's just getting worse. Their rejection of the truth is causing them to move further and further away from God. Next thing you know, they start getting hungry for stuff they ain't supposed to be hungry for. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. People talking about, see, you know what? <laughs> I'm just going to say it. When you start having conversations with people out there, I'm just letting you know. The first thing that the homosexual community said, well, it doesn't say anything about homosexuality in the New Testament. What are you talking about? You need to read Romans chapter 1. It just said it right there. Now the new thing is, yeah, but Jesus never said anything about it. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's what they say. Let me just make this clear. And we're not over here to bash on homosexuals. The truth being is this. If you live in a life of fornication, if you live in a life of sex outside of marriage, if you live in a life of adultery, if you live in a life where you're looking at internet pornography, if you live in a life where you're doing drugs and, and, and alcohol, if you live in a life that's contrary to the word of God, guess what? You're in contradistinction to the word of God. You are not living your life according to the ways of God any more than what a homosexual, a homosexual is living their lives That's according right. to. Right. So we don't over here picking on nobody. We'll pick on everybody, including the preacher, if he ain't right. The fact right. of the matter is, is that the word of God stands on its own. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. It says right here, it says they changed for vile affections. They women did the not change the natural use into that which is against nature. In other words, they 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 quit using men the way men were supposed to be used, and they, they went with one another. And likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. In other words, it was do them. The things that they were doing and the result of it and the fact that it hardened their heart and darkened their heart and moved them further and further away from God is what they deserved when it was all said and done. Because what they'll try to say is, is that nature says blah, blah, blah. I'm going to tell you what the Word of God says. And let me tell you what Lauren Larson said. If you got an island full of men somebody's gonna, and an island full of women, somebody's going to have to swim in order for the population to continue to increase because it's against nature. It don't work that way. The stuff don't fit and you don't pre-procreate through this type of behavior. If, if homosexuality was designed by God, guess what? We wouldn't even have human beings on the earth today. It don't take a whole lot of brains to figure it out. It says right here, uh, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, Deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. He put all them people together with the homosexuals. <laughs> oh, Lord, I'm in trouble. The Lord knows I was disobedient to mama on more than one occasion. Backbiters. How many times do you back bitch your friend? <laughs> whisperers. Talking bad about people behind their back. Gossiping. Lord, they got people still in church. Filled with, in, churches filled with folks. For what I don't know, it's almost like smoking crack or something, man. Gossip. It's like people get a thrill out of that stuff. I know that I used I used to do a little juicy morsel, boy. Talk talk about somebody behind their back. I mean, how does that make us feel good? I don't know, but for some reason we like to do it. Backbiters and whisperers talking bad about folk. 
I used to think that teenage girls were the worst, but the reality is that teenage boys and grown men are just as grown bad men. as a teenage girl. I know, I see y'all out there behind that, outside that store, Scott. No, I'm just <laughs> but, but the truth is, we do that, right? We, we get caught up in that. We just want to talk about other people's stuff. And, you know, look, I realize that every now and then you got somebody that you can trust and you can, and it's probably still not right. It isn't right. But you got somebody you can trust and you got an agreement, you know, look, hey, the stuff that we talk about, we ain't going to broadcast that stuff. The problem is, is that when people just loose lip, start talking about people and it harms their character, it damages them, yeah. slanders them, can't get that stuff back, mm -hmm. you know? It says right here, um, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. So basically at the end there, it's saying that if we're in agreement with them, if we're in agreement with the world and the way the world sees things, I'm not saying that you don't have any acquaintances that do some of these things, that you don't know people. I mean, we got to be careful, you know, how are they going to hear about Jesus? But when we in close knit fellowship with them and we're, we're in communion with them and they think that we're in agreement with them, dude, that's a problem. The word of God said right there, it's a problem. Back to Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. The Apostle Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. To everyone that believes, to the Jew first, also to the Greek, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And so really, I titled this morning's message, The Power of Salvation. And one of the things that pointed out to me is I was wondering why you even mention I am not ashamed of the gospel, Paul. Why, you, why would you say I'm not ashamed of the gospel? You know, the story of the gospel and its main character, which is Jesus, is a story of a baby that was born in a manger. We've talked about that before. A, a little bitty baby born in a manger amongst stinky animals. Most of us haven't had to sleep in situations like that. I've slept in some pretty bad places. But I don't think I've ever slept in a manger. Uh, but, but you know, it's a story of a baby that was born in a manger. It's a story of an unknown carpenter that died on two pieces of wood through Roman crucifixion, which was the most degrading, humiliating type of execution that Rome offered. It, Rome, in its pride, was a conqueror of nations, was a stripper of power. Rome was powerful and full of pride, and Rome would look at a situation regarding the gospel as pure silliness, shame, humiliation, and all of its pomp and circumstance, and all of its power, and all of its prestige, and all of its money, and all of the worldly possessions and the material things that it offered, it would look at the gospel story as pure silliness. I'm ashamed to even, don't, don't even, I can remember one time, I don't know why these kind of thoughts run in my mind, but I remember one time I used to hang out with this dude in Houston, and I don't know, I, I think this guy actually cut his eye like G.I. Joe, I think he did that on purpose, and we got it stitched, and I mean, everybody thought this dude was so cool, I mean, he rode skateboard, had this long hair, he would get in fight, you know, he was just, oh yeah, man, and I can just remember one day we were going to this concert, this is, this is, I'm trying to, what is the illustration, I'm trying to show you the heart of the world. We're riding in this car. We're going to this concert. I don't know who we were going to see. I was only like 15, 16 years old. He was probably about 17, 18. And we're driving down the road, and these people pull up on the side of us. And I'm just looking at these people out of the car, and he tells me, quit looking at them people. They're ugly. The pride of the world. In other words, in his mind, they were ugly. They were losers. What are you doing looking at them? You don't look at, you don't even give people the, the time of day. It, the pride that oozed, that's the world. That's Rome. I don't even want to hear this story. It's a ridiculous story. It makes no sense to the logical mind that a baby born in a manger, that some unknown carpenter would die on two pieces of wood and somehow there's power connected to this. It doesn't make any sense. It's silliness. 
The gospel of God, once again, it, it, it creates an embarrassment to the logical mind because the story of the gospel makes no sense. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, it says it right there. Paul, Paul says it. It says, the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. The natural man. What does that mean? The one is not saved. The one that's thinking with his natural mind and his logic that does not have the Spirit of God living on the inside of him, this gospel story makes no sense to him because it has to be spiritually understood. The world like Rome is full of pride and the message that lives in us, the message that Paul preached, the gospel is foolishness to the prideful world. It looks like weakness to them. Therefore, they despise it and are ashamed of it, but not Paul. Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, I can remember I talked about it a little bit in when I was first starting off about the concept of the gospel looking weak to the mind. And I can remember, and I've shared this before, that when I was a young boy, I mean, in my heart, I'm going to be honest with you. I mean, I can look back and think soberly about myself. As a little boy, my heart was soft towards the things of God. I didn't know anything about God. I mean, not much. Mama tried to teach me some prayers and mom, you know, loved God the way she knew to love God. We didn't reject God, but I didn't really know God. But I can remember one time, I don't remember where we were living, that I walked into a Catholic church and I sat down and I saw Jesus hanging on that cross. And that way they depicted his body. And maybe he was slim like that. I don't know. But I just remember seeing that skinny body hanging there on that cross and thinking in my mind, my little impressionable mind, look how weak that looks. I'm, I'm not proud of it. I'm just telling you what I thought. I'm being transparent. The mindset of the world, the way that we have been programmed to think, looks at things regarding the gospel and the kingdom of God when we're looking at it from a natural perspective as though it's weakness. As though there is no power connected to it. It doesn't make any sense. The things that I want to speak to you about out of those couple of verses of scripture regard the gospel, salvation, and righteousness. The first thing I want to talk to you about is the gospel. He said the gospel, it is the power of God. The gospel is a message and the gospel message is the preaching of the cross. If you go to 1 Corinthians 1.18, it's kind of like a similar type passage saying a similar thing that Paul said in the in the Romans passage he says for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness but unto us which are saved it is the power of God in both of those passages Paul talks about the power of God in both of those passages one he says he, he, he says the world thinks it's foolish and the other one he says I am not ashamed he, he, he's very aware that the world is ashamed and thinks that the gospel is foolishness. But at the same time, he's also aware that the gospel is the power of God. Why does he say the gospel is the power of God in one place and the preaching of the cross is the power of God in another place? Because the preaching of the cross is the gospel of God. Amen. The preaching, the word preaching there is logos and literally means message. The word of the cross. When you proclaim the message of the cross. Not just the fact that he died on two pieces of wood, but the spiritual victory that was won there is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power of God. The word literally, gospel, and most of us know this, means good news. And God has been communicating his plan of salvation to the world since sin entered the world. From the killing of that innocent animal in the garden to cover Adam and Eve's sin to all the Old Testament sacrifices, the gospel was preached throughout the Old Testament. If you go back to Romans 1, 1 and 2, I just wanted to point out to you that what the Apostle Paul said in Romans 1. He said, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. <clears throat> no, next verse. Which he had promised before by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. The only reason I point these things out to you is because I tell you the same thing repetitively week after week. You know, and I hope that oftentimes that you don't get tired of it. But at the same time, you, if you want to get tired of it, that's fine. But it's repetitively put in the Bible. 
So when you read it, you got to find it and you got to talk about it. Amen. The point here is, is that what Paul's saying is, is that God's been preaching salvation history. Amen. When you write the chronology up on the board and you talk about the history of Israel and how God called Abraham and made a nation and gave us Jesus through the Old Testament, through his prophets, He's been telling us beforehand the gospel message, communicating it to a lost and a dying world that he has a plan to save mankind. The prophets preached the gospel. 1,000 years before Jesus would ever be born, Psalm 22, verse 1, David preached the gospel. David was a prophet used by God. Hallelujah. He was a king used by God. And in Psalm 22, verse 1, he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You ever heard that before? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 1,000 years before Jesus would ever walk on the face of the earth, David, the prophet, speaks forth the words that Jesus will cry out of his mouth as he hangs on the cross. The, the King David said those words a thousand years before Jesus ever showed up. What we're talking about this morning is that God, through the prophets, has been preaching the gospel message. Didn't just show up yesterday. Didn't just show up with some crazy looking preacher you saw in the corner that all of a sudden just one day gave up drugs and started preaching. No, this thing's been going on and it's been changing people's lives right for on. thousands yeah. and thousands of years. <laughs> Mankind's just been, hey man, mankind's just been suppressing the truth. It's time to get the truth out. It says, why have you forsaken me? When Jesus said this while hanging on the cross, and we've talked about this many times, but let us be reminded, he was forsaken. He felt separation from the presence of the Father, not because of his sin, because he had no sin, but because your sin, my sin, was placed upon him. The Father can't look at sin. God, the Father, judged sin on his Son, allowing you and I now, if we'll believe in the gospel message, to be reconciled back to him and to have a relationship with God. That's part of the good news. The news that Jesus took our sin, our sin on him and paid its penalty by paying sin's wages. That's what we're talking about right now. The first point that I'm talking about is the gospel. The fact that it means good news and the fact that the prophets preached it in the past. Romans chapter 6 verse 23. Jesus took the wage of sin. We talked about this earlier. I actually quoted the scripture. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The point that I was trying to make with that earlier and the point that I'm making with that whenever Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Is that Jesus had no sin. Jesus took our sin. He paid the debt of sin because the debt of sin was death. And he offered up his sinless life in our place. And because of that, in that moment of time, he was separated from the father's presence. And he cried out, my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? But also in Psalm 22, verses 16 through 18, same psalm, same writer, David, same time frame, 1,000 years before Jesus. Look what he said. Psalm 22, verse 16 through 18. For dogs have compassed me. He's not talking about literal dogs at the... <clears throat> he's, not talk he's talking about the cross. 1,000 years before Jesus showed up, David's talking about the cross. I want to make sure we're all on the same page. He's not talking about literal dogs down at the bottom of the cross barking. He's talking about, he's calling men dogs, the way that they're behaving. Dogs have compassed me. In other words, they've surrounded me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. 1,000 years before Jesus ever showed up, the prophet David spoke of the fact that he, the Messiah, would have his hands and his feet pierced. Then he goes on to say, I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. If you read the Matthew account of the crucifixion, what does it say? It says that the Roman soldiers were down there shooting dice for the clothes of Jesus. 1,000 years before Jesus ever showed up, the prophets preached the gospel and told the story of how Jesus would come and he would die on the cross. Isaiah chapter 53 verses 4 through 6. 700 years before Jesus ever showed up. Surely <clears throat> he, talking about Messiah, talking about the one that would come, has borne our griefs and carried our sorrow. Yet we did esteem him stricken. In other words, we looked at him as though he was 
He was stricken. He was, he was smitten of God. He was afflicted. We looked at him as though he were cursed. That's what the world looks at him. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. What does that mean? It means he took this, all this penalty because of us. Because of our sin. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like shape <coughs> upon astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. We look at him as though he's weak. We look at him. Isaiah said that there was nothing beautiful about him that we would, oh, wow, look at that hero. We wouldn't have looked at him that way. But the reality of it is, is that the gospel says that he took our sin. It was because of us. But because, because of the fact that we, have, all of us, have gone astray. It was because of us that all of these things happened to him. The gospel is the good news for fallen man. It communicates that even though man is sinful and separated from God, God has a plan for restoration, a plan that will bring sinful man back to him. That brings me to point number two. The first point is gospel. Second point is salvation. Let's read. This is a long passage of scripture, but let's let's read uh, Luke chapter one, verses 67 through 77. Just bear with me. We're almost there. It says in verse 67, And his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, Who was Zacharias' father to? John the Baptist. So John the Baptist's daddy, Zacharias, his mouth, he had been mute for a period of time, couldn't talk, and then all of a sudden the Holy Spirit hit him when he was in the temple, and he began to prophesy. And this is what he said. He said, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. Yes. The word redeemed means to purchase with a ransom. Jesus purchased you and paid a ransom for you, not with coin, but with his blood. He says, uh, and he has raised up a horn of salvation for us. The word horn in the Old Testament and in the Bible is terminology for power. Animals with horns would fight one another. The altar had horns on it. A horn is a sign of power. God, Zacharias is saying, God with power raised up salvation for us. In the house of his servant David, again, going back to the prophecies that said that the Messiah would come from David. As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began. There it is again. You see what I'm trying to say? There it is again. God has been preaching salvation history for thousands of years. The prophets preached. Everybody else was aware of it. But because we came from other nations, because we came from Gentile nations, because our people didn't know, we didn't know. This message has been for thousands of years being preached. What, is it, what does it say? That we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us. Real quick on that, I want you to be aware, salvation to these people at this time was both corporate and individual. We'll talk about that in a second. To perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham, that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear and holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And thou, child, shall be called the prophet of the highest. Talking about John the Baptist. For thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. Salvation, the word literally means deliverance. The meaning of the word soteria means to be delivered, and it was applied both corporately and also individually. What do you mean corporately? Israel was looking for deliverance as a nation. Many of you already know that, but they were under the bondage of the Roman Empire. They were not their own people. They were slaves to Rome. They couldn't just, it wasn't like living in America. They owed Caesar money. They had to pay Caesar money. They, they could not just live on their own. They didn't have their own powerful army anymore. They had lost all of their power. Just as we do individually, born in sin, lose power and under bondage to sin, Israel was under bondage to Rome. One thing, if you'll go to uh, Psalm chapter 2 real quick, I want you to see, I want to give you a little bit more of a clear understanding about this corporate deliverance, this corporate salvation. 
If you get a picture, and I've tried to explain this to you before, if you looked at a globe and you saw all of the nations on the globe, and you saw that little bitty dot called Israel right there, what you would realize is that everything else around them was the world, and they were the people of God. Little bitty old people of God. And the rest of the world is all against them, and still against them today, right? And you and I, as the people of God, as Christians, in a similar fashion, are oftentimes persecuted by the world. The world, listen to me, if you're, the world is completely different than the kingdom of God. <clears throat> In Psalm chapter 2, this is written once again by the people of God. And basically what it's saying is, why do the heathen rage? The word heathen means people that are not of the people of God. People that come from other nations. Why do the heathen rage? Why do the people imagine a vain thing? means an empty thing. Go to the next verse. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. What does that mean? It means that the leadership of all the nations of the world, they don't realize why they're doing it. It's because the enemy is behind it. But the whole world is against Israel. The whole world is against the gospel. The whole world is against the kingdom of God. There's other scriptures that talk about the prince of this world, the God of this world, that he operates with another spirit, and he's behind all of that stuff. He's behind all of that stuff, pushing mankind to go in an opposite direction. He's pushing you to rebel against God. He's pushing the world to rebel against God. It says, it says, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. What does that mean? It means that the world is saying, I don't want God holding me down. I don't want to be tied up by God. I want to break his bands and I want to do what I want to do. Keep going. He says, he that sits, did we just lose our TV here? <laughs> he that sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. It means in the end. Judgment's coming and they're going to be confused. The world's going to be confused. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Zion is another name for Jerusalem. The temple of God is in Jerusalem, representing the presence of God. He speaks of a king that will come a thousand years later. He speaks of a people, his people Israel. From them would come a king. And, and he's talking about salvation. I will, go ahead. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. A thousand years before Jesus would be born, the Lord said that he would have a son and that, that he would give birth to a son. That, that, that's, that's amazing. That a thousand years, God said that it was going to happen and it happened. Amen? Keep going. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thy inheritance. In other words, my son Jesus, we know it's Jesus. My son Jesus, ask me, and I will give all these nations as your inheritance. One day Jesus is coming back, he's going to rule as a king. And the uttermost parts of the earth for your possession. Keep going. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Next verse. Be wise now, therefore, O you kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Next verse. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Next verse. Kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish from the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all they that put their trust in him. What is it saying? Basically it's saying that the whole world is against Israel. The whole world is against the kingdom of God, which includes the people of God today. And that the, that the whole world is trying to reject Israel. God and his gospel message that surrounds his son, but that God the Father has promised the son that he would inherit the earth. God the Father has promised that this earth would be his possession and that the word to be proclaimed and decreed to the world today is kiss the son, embrace the son, serve the son, because there's a day of judgment coming. And what I need you to know is, is that salvation was both corporate, but it's also individual. God's salvation brings deliverance from the bondage and the slavery that sin holds over men. Once again, the Apostle Paul started his letter by saying, I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. I'm a slave of Jesus. Paul traded in his slavery to sin to his slavery to Jesus. One thing about a slave is this, and we all struggle with this, but a slave, his will is swallowed up in his master's will. That means it don't really, I'm just saying, it don't really matter what the slave wants. Yeah. His master's will supersedes his will. Now we know that slavery 
it was a horrible thing. I mean, you're taking the rights of another human being. But in the spiritual sense, it's not that way. See, in the kingdom of darkness, it's that way. The enemy holds you in slavery and bondage, and it's like the slavery that we've known that was horrible. It takes the rights and the will of another human being and owns it as its own possession. It will drive that human being to do the very thing that it doesn't want to do, and he has no say-so in the matter. The kingdom of God is not that way. When the apostle Paul says, I'm a slave of Jesus, not because God said, I'm going to tie you up and make you serve me. No, it's because God gave him a free will and he willingly bowed his knee and said, I want to be a slave of you, Lord. I am not my own. I've been purchased with a price. When you get a revelation that God so loved you and uh, all the bad stuff you did and you could have never uh, been right in the eyes of God, but yet God offered up his son Jesus. Shed his blood to give his life to purchase you back. A slave of Christ freely submits himself. You know, before you think in your heart the wrong way and say, oh, I don't want anybody telling me what to do, what I can and can't do. I, I, I want to be my own man. I sure don't want to be anyone's slave. If that's what Paul wanted, that's fine. But that is, that's not for me. Hold on a second. You need to understand something. Go to Philippians chapter 2, verse 7. And eight. Now, we've talked about this verse of Scripture a lot. But what you need to understand something is this. The Apostle Paul didn't just come up with this on his own. He learned this from somebody. The Apostle Paul learned this lifestyle from somebody else. And the person that he learned it from was Jesus. Amen. Jesus made himself to be a servant. To lower himself. To not live according to his own will. You remember his words in the Garden of Gethsemane. What did he say? Father, not my will, but your will be done. He says right here, he made himself, talking about Jesus, of no reputation. He took upon himself the form of a servant, the form of a slave, and was made in the likeness of men. And if you go on and you read it, the reason why was so that he could die. That's right. So that he could be obedient to the Father and die. Why? For you, for me. That's where the Apostle Paul learned that from. All about the gospel. All about the gospel of salvation. The last thing I want to talk to you about, and I'm about to close, is about righteousness. He said, therein is the righteousness of God revealed. God's righteousness is in a certain list of actions. We need to understand that. God's righteousness is in a certain list of actions or things that I do or don't do. That's what you call relative righteousness. Instead, God's righteousness is a person, and his name is Jesus. Right. The difference between relative righteousness versus God's righteousness is that relative righteousness has the absence of standards. In other words, I make up my own rules as we go. Okay. Um, man, what I'm trying to tell you is that man's perception doesn't define righteousness. He tries to. He says, you know, if you go and you talk to somebody on the street and you say, hey, man, you think you're going to heaven? Oh, yeah, I didn't want to have it. Well, why is that? Oh, because I never killed nobody. Oh, okay. <laughs> I never killed nobody. I never, um, and then if you start talking to some real holy folk, well, I never did drugs. I never drank. I never, I never, I never committed fornication. I never, you know, I never did this. I never did that. So in their own mind, they create their own standards. So it's relative to what their perception is. So in other words, if we look at people in the world, everybody's got different standards of what righteousness is or being a good person is. And from that, they'll say, hey, don't judge me, man. I won't judge you. It's all good. Don't be putting your Jesus stuff on me, bro. If you want to serve Buddha, let him serve Buddha. If you want to serve Krishna, let him serve Krishna. If he wants to live his life any way he wants to, well, who are you to tell? I'm, not, I'm here to tell you what Jesus said. Because see, this is the thing. We got a problem. If I, if I, my understanding of the Bible is right, because I know there's a lot of people out there that say, oh, well, you just ain't got it figured. Okay. If my understanding of the Bible is right, then this is, a, there's one way out. Amen. God's way. Well, then why is there all this confusion? Why are there many ways? Because there's a, per, a fallen angel named Satan, and he's a liar, and he's the author of confusion. Amen. And I'm not real smart, but if I was a fallen angel trying to deceive everybody, I come up with a whole bunch of different ways, and I tell people, if you say that your way is the only right way, then you're a bigot, and, and, and you're just trying to tell, you, you, you know what I'm saying, you think you're the only one that's right, and lead people down the wrong path. 
God doesn't define righteousness the way that man defines righteousness. Man defines righteousness based on his own perception. God defines righteousness that his name is Jesus. In Luke chapter 18, verses 10 through 14, this is an example of relative righteousness. A religious man. He went to the temple to pray. And there was another man there who was a tax collector, which they were considered the worst of society. And the two of them presented, the, presented differently. Two men went into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee, the other a publican, which means a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I'm not as other men. Look at that, he's self-righteous. He's already compared himself to other people and thinks that he's better than everybody. You ever been around somebody like that? I hope I don't come across the people like that. I'm sure I do. That's because the devil's always whispering in people's ears, making, trying to turn everybody off. And sometimes I probably do act self-righteous. If we're all honest with one another. But he said, I thank God that I'm not as other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers. I don't do all that stuff. Or even as this tax collector. Go on. He says, I fast twice in the week. Look at what I do. Yeah. Relative righteousness. I give tithes of all that I possess. I give my money to the church. I'm righteous. Next verse. And the publican or the tax collector standing far off would not lift up so much his eyes and they had him but smote his breast saying, God be merciful to me a sinner. He was beating his chest. He wouldn't look up to the presence of God. He knew that he wasn't right in the eyes of God. Jesus said, who do you think went home justified that day or righteous in the eyes of God? It sure wasn't this other dude that was looking at all his righteousness and all of his stuff that he was doing. It was the one that came to the realization that he wasn't right and that he gave his heart to Jesus. God says righteousness is something different. Romans chapter 10 verses 3 through 4. I'm closing with these two scriptures. Romans 10 verses 3 through 4. Israel was trying to create their own righteousness through works, through the things that they did. Just like the, this religious leader that we just read about. The apostle Paul says in Romans 10. For they, talking about Israel, being ignorant of God's righteousness. So sometimes people just don't even understand what God's righteousness looks like. Can't beat blame people if they don't understand. You know? They, didn't, they, didn't, they were ignorant of God's righteousness. And so they went about trying to establish their own righteousness. But they have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Now the problem with Israel was is that God sent Jesus. But they rejected him. And so instead of embracing God's righteousness, they rejected it and they tried to create their own righteousness. People in the church still do that today. They try to create their own righteousness through the things that they do instead of submitting to the righteousness of the Lord. Next verse. For Christ is the end of the law, works, however you want to look at it, for righteousness to everyone that believes. Jesus is righteousness. And last verse that we're going to talk about is Romans 3.21. We've talked about this many times in the church. But it says, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. That's kind of a hard verse to understand, but basically what it's saying is, Paul's saying, Jesus is God's righteousness, and Jesus is now manifested. After all them thousands of years of the prophets telling the story, after all them thousands of years of all them animals being sacrificed and all that blood. I saw this girl that she brings her kids to the clinic. I'm not trying to gross you out. She brings her kids to the clinic and she has scrubs on. I'm like, hey, how you doing? You know, where are you working? Oh, terrible general. I said, are you a nurse? No, no, not yet. Oh, you're a nurse at school yet? I'm like, how do you like the job? I don't like the trauma. And I, and I was uh, sitting there and thinking, maybe I thought of that to say this. I said, yeah, it kind of gets kind of rough, huh? especially when you can, there's so much blood, you can smell it. If you ain't ever been in it, you don't know what I'm talking about. Sometimes when trauma's coming in, there's just blood everywhere. You know, because you've been cleaning them rooms up, right? You can smell the blood. I said, that's all right, it gets better as time goes on. She said, well, I sure hope so. But what I'm trying to tell you is I'm trying to give you a visual. The blood that was shed. Thousands of years of sacrifices blood poured out. Time and again, the bleeding of sheep, the sounding, the moaning and lowing of the cattle before their life was taken and their blood was poured out. And what does it all represent? The severity of sin. The wages of sin is death. 
And for thousands of years, the prophets preached it. For thousands of years, the sacrifices preached it. Now God's righteousness has been manifested in the person of Jesus, and Jesus fulfilled the sacrifice.